Hi guys, it is an icy, chilly day down here in the heart of Texas here in early November as the first polar vortex of the year slams into the United States. Uh, but we are going to go over to the other side of, uh, of the pond. We're going to go to southern Italy where I guess there's no polar vortex, but maybe it's, it's flooding over there where I have the great pleasure of interviewing today. This is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles and I have the great pleasure of interviewing a fellow named Matthew Slater. You might recognize Matt Slater's name. I have read a couple of his essays before on this channel, but to steer you into this conversation Matthew Slater calls himself a community currency engineer, having spent the last decade building open source software for local exchange trading systems. He also helped create a free, massive, open online course called Money and Society, which tries to help us understand money. And we will be asking Matt to help Matthew help us understand money here shortly. In the last year, Matthew has been working with Professor Jim Bendell of Deep Adaptation fame, and he holds a bachelor's degree in theology from Cardiff University, which we will start off this conversation with. But before we do, Matthew Slater, come on and say hello to the folks at Collapse Chronicles, and we will dive right into this conversation. Hello, folks at Collapse Chronicles. It's an honor to be here and to have a conversation with you. Okay, well, we're just going to dive right in. So, uh, Matthew Slater, how do you go from getting a theology degree, I believe, what, in 1993, to landing in, uh, in, in this rabbit hole and being interviewed on Collapse Chronicles? Just tell us a little bit about your own evolution over the last 20, 25 years. Well, I did the theology degree because uh, at the age of 17, just before choosing my degree, I converted to being an evangelical Christian. Um, the, the Christianity didn't really last the course of the degree, and I sort of slid to the left of Christianity and then fell right out and got depressed for many years and traveled a lot. Um, and finally, by the age of about 32, I had worked out that I wanted to be a force for good in the world. And I had also learned to do a bit of computer programming by myself. And I worked for a non-profit doing emergency shelter for uh, disasters and refugees and refugee camps and things. But this wasn't really something that I felt I owned. And so... Uh, living in Geneva, um, very comfortably, I might say, on a minimum wage, I wanted to strike out on my own and find something uh, that I could become an expert in, having had some careers advice and being told that my personality was one that wanted to be an expert. And so I dived straight into local exchange trading systems because they struck me as rather interesting and rather under-resourced. Now, these things are um, local community groups. Um, it's like a club, but they maintain a directory of everything that everybody can do for each other and also sometimes everything that everybody might want from each other. And when they meet up and do things, they will then uh, record a debt between each other on a ledger. And so everybody in a let's has their own balance, positive or negative uh, meaning that the system owes them something or they owe the system something. And so you can start to see it's very money-like, it feels money-like, and yet somehow uh, very different to money because it's used differently. So it's, so it's the alternative currency, and I, I, I want to make sure that people are not confusing this with 
or, or maybe it is. I, maybe I am uh, making a mistake here. I'm, I'm thinking this is a totally separate track from these cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Is, is, is that correct? Totally separate. These things were beginning in the late 80s. Um, Bitcoin started in 2009. Um, so there were, there were lets really all over the uh, English-speaking world and in much of Europe. So there's lots in Canada, USA, Australia. Um, but because I was in Geneva, uh, I started writing some open source software and it started to spread amongst the French-speaking let's groups. So there's a few hundred of them, even to this day, and about um, more than a third are using my software. So how does does a let's compare to, uh, we may have heard this term, the, the bar, these barter networks? So it, it goes beyond that, where there's actually some form, some unit of exchange. So it's not directly bartering goods and services between members, or is it? Well, there are different definitions of barter. So you can imagine uh, two people meeting in a field and exchanging uh, a fish and a chicken, and that would be a barter. But a barter network does actually have a unit of account in which everything that's traded is measured. So you can value the fish and you can value the chicken in, let's say, dollars. That doesn't mean dollars change hands. It just means dollars are owed and uh, dollar debts are cancelled out later on. Um, that's really interesting, as far as I'm concerned, that you can do this trade denominated in dollars without dollars changing hands. And all it takes is that every person in the network must give to the network and receive from the network equally. And then you don't need any money to settle the difference. And the same thing's happening in LETS. So uh, in a business barter network, Everyone is trading uh, their business surplus using barter dollars or trade dollars. But in a let's, they'll make their own unit of account. Um, and they'll usually name it after some local feature or some local pun. So in, uh, in Brixton, in London, their unit of account was called the brick. And in Cambridge, where I started off, the unit of account was called the cam, which is the name of the river. And that unit doesn't really correspond to anything monetary. Um, it's more often an amount of time, like it might be 10 minutes or 15 minutes or one hour. Um, and then there's this other network, the time banks. They do something very similar, but they insist that all the things you do for each other are counted on the ledger in hours. So there's these three things, business barter networks, lets and time banks, and they're all using this uh, same accounting mechanism, which is often called mutual credit, because there's no money in it. It's just a matter of how much everybody owes everybody else at a given moment. So how, and generally, in one, I think there's one of these in where I'm getting ready to move up in Ithaca, New York. I, I'm pretty sure they have one, and one of these going in Ithaca. So when you say local, are, I mean, how many people are, are usually in, involved in a let's? Are, are we talking a dozen, or are we talking 10,000? How small and how big can these get? A few of them got to be uh, large, meaning uh, more than a thousand, but most of them never really got above about 150 paying members in a given year. Um, and of those 150, many of them wouldn't be very active. So these systems, uh, although they're quite numerous, you wouldn't say that they had a lot of social impact. And what I was trying to do in providing the open source software is to help them increase the social impact. Uh, before they had software, there was a huge administrative burden with lots of photocopying and posting things out, uh, and that involved costs as well. And the committee would, uh, would get burned out doing all yeah. of this work. So moving it online um, did save a lot of work, but I don't think the saved energy went into growing those systems. 
Okay. It sounds like you're not harboring any illusions that the, these lets will, will ever really go up against the, the global industrial economy as long as the global industrial economy is still humming along, but maybe it's something to look for on the other side of, of the bottleneck after the collapse of the global economy. Am I somewhat on the right track here? I think that's probably a more mature way of looking at it. Um, certainly, uh, in the first years I was doing it, I was uh, you know, playing the odds, but also hoping that um, this could be some kind of lever to help uh, to uh, grow in the cracks of capitalism um, to provide an alternative. But um, now I think of it more in terms of this is what the economy could be like. There doesn't have to be a scarcity of money. Um, most people are perfectly content to give and receive in equal quantity. It's only really the, the, the super rich and the capitalists and self-entitled people who uh, want to receive more than they give and who therefore need uh, uh, um, money to do that with. Um, so in a, in a better society, uh, yes, mutual credit systems could be a very appropriate form of money, if indeed money is needed. So do you... I, I, I always... Uh, whenever I ask questions like, like envisioning what it's going to look like in 2050, uh, I, I realize uh, that you, you're going to have to go somewhat out on a limb here. But <laughs> what is your, are, are these going to be a lot more common on the planet in 2050 than they are in 2020? The way things are going is the way you're reading the tea leaves? Well, if they are, they probably won't be using the Let's brand it's just not dynamic. It's not going to be there in 20, 30 years time. It's going to be something else, some other framing of the exchange economy. Well, let, OK, let me turn the question on on its head. Where do you picture the big, you know, the global economic machine that we have uh, spinning out of control at, at the moment? Uh, is it going, what's it going to look like in 30 years? Oh, that's a very different question. Um, of course, uh, I don't know the answer. I can say that if it carries on along its current trajectory, it's going to run out of liquidity. Um, it's going to seize up. But of course, uh, extraordinary measures can be taken, as we've seen, when the, when the world runs out of liquidity. They can still do bailouts. They can still issue new debt far, far into the future. Um, and so that provides a form of liquidity, but it gets starts to get very, very unbalanced. And it's up to the policymakers how things get unbalanced, because the economy has all sorts of different moving parts, and policymakers can direct liquidity and problems and taxes and regulations into different parts of the economy. So it's, I can't predict how it's going to work out. I can only say that the system as it is now is unsustainable. It's been failing for the last 10 years in its unsustainability. It's getting more unsustainable and more risky and more leveraged. And that points towards another financial crash. But at the same time, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, and there are always ways to divert those accidents. Like if you've got proper control over monetary policy, you can export your financial disasters to other countries. And the United States is particularly good at this because its domestic currency is also the global currency. So it's very hard to say with any precision at all what will happen in the future and who's going to pay the price for all this unpayable debt. Okay, you mentioned in, in a recent essay that we're going to be getting into more deeply here in a few minutes, but since we're talking along these lines, I'm just going to read this sentence. That's not including the economy, another system which nobody understands and which is designed, designed to fail suddenly, unexpectedly, 
and catastrophically. What I, I, I mainly want you to well, I want you to go on a rip on what what that what that whole sentence means, but particularly this term uh, designed. It, you mean it's it, it was purposefully, voluntarily designed to collapse, or just by its design, it's going to accidentally do all this? It's a very interesting uh, theory of history as to how you think the economy is designed. Uh, and who does it and what their motives are. But I didn't mean to assert anything like that. I meant to say that if you look at the economy and uh, how it works, you can see um, what its design is going to point towards. Okay. So uh, right. in some way that you could talk about uh, intelligent design in the evolution debate, you know, everything looks designed, everything has a purpose. But I'm not saying that there's a, a designer. Uh, okay, okay. I I, I wanted to uh, to to clear that up. But what is your definition of suddenly, unexpectedly, and catastrophically? Well, I've only lived through one financial crisis in 2008, and that was sudden, unexpected, and catastrophic. And I think that that's how financial crises are designed to work, because if they worked in any other way, then they would be avoided. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you see be, another one on the horizon, yeah. obviously. Do you, do you see another 2008 uh, in, in the near future or something actually a whole lot bigger than what we saw in 2008? Well, this is it. Since 2008, I've been completely unconvinced by all the measures that have been put in place to stop 2008 happening again um, and predicting a financial crisis every day. But it doesn't happen. It hasn't happened. And when I say that it's going to be uh, sudden, unpredictable and catastrophic, I think what's going to happen is something other than a financial crisis. Uh, because everybody's too ready for a financial crisis. A financial crisis is too predictable. So that's what I was saying earlier. The policymakers are going to push all the unsustainable bubbles that need to explode sort of out of the economy and into somewhere else. Huh. So are, are you suggesting that they're, they're actually riding herd on this and they're in... in that that almost sounds like that you that you're saying it can be prevented. No, it can't be prevented because the system is unsustainable. The debt is growing and growing and growing. And someone's going to have to pay for it. Matthew has an excellent website called mattslats.net, which I am going to uh, put the link on to, and I really encourage you. There's There's all sorts of links and information all along this line of, uh, of talk, but we are going to switch gears since uh, we are already uh, one-third of the way through this conversation, and we're going to take the, the leap from the economic collapse to the climate crisis, and this is from an essay simply titled Climate Crisis that Matthew wrote a few months ago. And I'm, I'm going to read this paragraph and then, uh, and, and we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to let Matthew expand on this. So we, we've been talking about what Matt has been doing with his life uh, for at least the last 10 years. But now that he's looking at the, at the bigger picture, this is what he wrote uh, a few months ago. Suddenly, I am not so san sanguine. My last 10 years' work on complementary currencies has been an expression of optimism I did not feel, that it was possible for people to self-organize and run society differently. I felt even if there was the smallest chance of it being meaningful, in the face of such suffering, working to change the system was meaningful. Now, 
without time to change the system, it's hard to find purpose. We have been sunning ourselves on the beach until the tide went out way too far, and now we see the froth of the tsunami on the horizon. It is too late to install the early warning system, too late to reinforce our houses. Now we have only got time to run and to hope. It is time for me to admit that the system I was working to change for the better will be destroyed and all my work will be dashed on the rocks. It is too late to build a decentralized energy grid, too late to redesign finance, too late to build a better food system, too late to restore our national manufacturing base, too late to restore our soils and agriculture, too late for carbon capture technologies, too late to dismantle the fossil fuel leviathan, too late for every hope I clung to from last week to this. I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> Matthew Slater, that, that is one of the great uh, summations of what uh, probably the majority of people listening to this uh, are feeling. Is it too late? And if it is too late, what are we going to do about it? Well, that was written at a very pessimistic moment. I've bounced back a bit. Um, <laughs> so you have bounced know, back a bit. A bit. But it's really uh, about asking what does too late mean? I had been working all this time with an idea that we could change our society for the better. And maybe it's too late for that. But there still seems to be a lot more things that can be done in the time available. Also, when I wrote that, I had just been uh, reading, uh, watching Paul Beckwith on YouTube, and he was reporting how disastrous the um, the grain planting season was going. But looking at that from this point of view, it seems to have hardly affected the overall food harvests, and maybe the food system is more resilient than I thought it was back then. The wheat, so maybe I just want to, for, for, for the record, uh, the wheat and maize crops globally are actually both up in 2019. Uh -huh. If you believe the mainstream media re re reporting uh, that the harvest of, of both wheat and corn on the globe are actually, I think, up like 4% from last year, mm -hmm. not down. Well, this is a lesson to people like me not to immerse ourselves too much in the media bubbles. Because, of course, as the climate changes, things do get better in some places and worse in others. Things tend to get more unpredictable as well. And I think in the long term, the unpredictability is going to affect food rather badly. And it's, uh, it seems to be affecting the insects rather badly already. But it comes down to uh, what is there time left to do? Now, what's the meaning of my life? I'd always thought that the thing that I needed to do before I could die comfortably, as it were, was to reduce the suffering, the unnecessary human suffering that people inflict on each other, especially through politics, which is done on a mass scale. So I wanted to do something political. And it seems like the political systems now are completely dysfunctional. It's very hard to work through them. You know, 50 years ago, maybe I would have attempted to get into formal politics and join a party and maybe become a member of parliament, something like that. But that all seems really, really pointless now. And my ambition to uh, attempt to reduce suffering, I think it needs to be curbed back quite a lot. So, you know, instead of trying to bring a philosophical revolution which will change world history, um, maybe just um, focusing on my neighbours is more realistic. You know what I mean? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as I, as I always say, uh, all we have from this point forward uh, is each other. 
And so anyway, that that climate crisis uh, <clears throat> essay that you wrote this summer was, was kind of part one of a two-part essay, but I want to spend a, a few minutes getting deeper into uh, this essay that you wrote at the right at the end of July, which I read out uh, here on Collapse Chronicles and got a lot of positive response for, or uh, response over. And this is your essay, this is also on uh, Matt's website, mattslats.net, where he asked the question in the headline, how long have we got, which, uh, you know, it is is always the big question. That that's probably the number one question I get asked and refuse to answer. But uh, Matt Slater, let's hear your answer. How long have we got? And then we're going to go through this uh, this this article and and get you to expand on some of the points that you made. How long have we got? To do what? You know, you ask all these questions. What it what it is that uh, we're we're waiting for, and who is we? Uh, I mean, this it begs all of these different questions. So, take a run on your whole idea of 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 what th- this this is going to look like. I know that you're a fan of John Michael Greer, for instance. So it doesn't sound like you are predicting some. Overnight, what did you say? Uh, jump from capitalism to cannibalism. Uh, so, give us just some idea of how your reading of the tea leaves, what it's going to look like as this whole thing starts to fall apart. Well, I've had this vision of uh, looking at the financial system, which is the lens I tend to use. And I see that the wealth and the surplus of capitalism, it's, of course, it's created from future debt, um, that's going to retract towards the financial centres. So from that point of view, how long you've got depends how far away you are from the, the banking centres, London and New York and Hong Kong, how far you are away in the economy. Because we can already see that um, for some people, collapse uh, happened a long time ago, or they've they've only ever known collapse. If you think about countries in Africa, uh, they never even saw the the wealth that we all experience today and that we fear losing. So I think it's helpful to look at them as if they're already in collapse and that collapse is coming towards us um, closer to the financial centres. Um, And how long have we got? Well, it depends how you think that the system is going to break down. So I've talked about the unsustainability of debt, but then what happens when debt can't be paid? We've seen uh, in 2008, they just do a bailout. Uh, Some people think that they can't do that again. I think they probably could if there was uh, enough political will, if there was enough scaremongering, if... um, If the story went out that civilization was going to collapse, of course they could do another bailout and keep it going a bit longer. So what's going to be the trigger? Is it going to be the oil system? We're going to run out of oil or are oil prices going to spike and break everything? Well, no, I've been looking at peak oil and some people are talking about not peak supply of oil, but peak demand. It's no longer clear that the whole peak oil story is going to play out as a lot of people were saying several years ago. This idea of the bumpy plateau, have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. The oil uh, price. Uh, yeah, is, I, I'm um, very much on the fence, down. on the peak oil fence. And it sounds like, it's, would you describe yourself as being on the peak oil fence or are you firmly on one side or the other? Well, I'm not sure what peak oil means anymore. Of course, oil is finite. Uh, Of course, prices are going to have to go up in the long term if we don't reduce our consumption. But I understood that peak oil was a theory that uh, something was going to happen in the markets that would cause a collapse. And I don't think that it's going to happen that way. I think that bumpy plateau aside, prices are going to keep increasing in the long term. 
and oil is going to become less and less available to the poorer people. Is that a collapse? Well, it is for the poor people. Well, and then, and, and then, of course, the the other, the the whole other conversation since uh, the, the famous "Do the Math" article appeared about four or five years ago. I think it was in Rolling Stone. Isn't that where that "Do the Math" story? That what we're in a race now is before peak oil ever. It, it, ever takes down global industrial society if we burn the you know what is it like 20 percent of uh, of the provable reserves yeah. that the climate change is, is going to uh come from behind and, and suddenly uh be the the biggest horse in this race and it's just a race between peak oil and 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 climate change and global warming from the burning of all of this oil. So wh where do you fall in on that horse race? Uh, wh what's going to cause the most grief to global industrial society? Uh, the peak oil pe uh, sirens or the uh, global warming sirens? Or is it all going to come washing in together in that tsunami that you see out there frothing on the... Everything's <laughs> connected. I think we have to acknowledge with this question, how long have we got, that we just cannot know. And the answer is going to be different for all of us. And so the real question is, how do we live not knowing how long we've got? That, 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 that is the, the ultimate question. Before we start answering that, because I do want to get into the, the deep ad adaptation stuff, I just want, want, want to touch uh, on a couple of more points you were making in this. Uh, okay. in, in this, it, now, it, it sounds to me like like you clearly are not in the human, the near term human extinction by twenty thirty camp, and that you have uh, some some problem with with with, with that camp being too alarmist and, and fear-mongering, or am I understanding you correctly? Talk about the near-term human extinction movement uh, in, in 2030 and how you think of, what you think of that. Well, I'm, I wonder, what is the mechanism by which people think that humans will go extinct in 2030? Uh, what could possibly cause every human on the planet to die in the next 10 years? Um, it's very hard to think of anything. Um, of course, you can imagine plagues and things causing mass deaths. Uh, you can imagine the population being reduced greatly in uh, any number of ways. But extinction? I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I don't know how people think it's going to happen. And I'd rather be, uh, if I'm going to be afraid of something, I'd rather be afraid of something that I could just put my finger on a little more than uh, a vague fear of um, something I can't really do anything about. And then at the, about what I what I enjoyed so much about your your essay is uh, is is how you pointed out the 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 flip side of that. Uh, I'm just going to read this paragraph. At the more respectable end of the panic spectrum, I love that the respectable end of the uh -huh. panic spectrum. The United Nations is pushing countries to make 2050 commitments, which could be even more irresponsible than, you know, predicting human extinction by 2030. This date, meaning 2050, could be even more responsible and less accurate if by being slow to incorporate the latest science it gives anyone the impression that we have wiggle room. I, I, I really like the way you articulated that. So talk about uh, the, the United Nations response and the Paris Climate Agreement and, you know, that kind of response leading people to think that, that we have more time than we do have. I don't know if you've covered before about the IPCC and how there's a, a systemic bias in the way the IPCC works, uh, because they want to get, they want to publish consensus, 
which means they want to publish what every country agrees on. And so because of that, you're going to get uh, the least pessimistic scenario or the most optimistic scenario or the least divergent scenario. So we need to read the IPCC reports with that in mind. But I've been reading some other reports because um, working with Jen Bendel, I get to read a lot. Uh, and you see these phrases uh, coming out of the UN about, you know, the need for profound system change, um, even uh, the odd mention of possible human extinction. And you can see that uh, those bureaucrats are having the same fears that we are, but they have to publish it in bureaucratic speak. And, and, and that's where we, we come up with, with all of these, where you say every number you hear representing a target threshold or deadline, such as 12 years, one and a half degrees, 2050 yeah. tipping point, is chosen by public relations advisors as a strategic target for policymakers and should be taken with a large pinch of salt. Uh, yeah, it doesn't represent reality. This It's how the system works, that they have to come up with some numbers and some targets, uh, and then they try and set the policies accordingly. You can't just say, okay, let's go full steam ahead, decarbonization. Um, doesn't work like that at all. Okay, so we're, I, I want to touch on this one more as, as kind of a segue into the next part of this conversation. I, I cannot believe where the time goes. And, and when I when I do these, okay, let's move down to this this statement in this excellent, and I'll put the link to this essay, guys. If you have not read this essay, how long have we got? All right, the future most of us should be concerned about is not death in a heat wave or hurricane, or drowning in a rising tide but social and political failure in a civilization unable to adapt to changes in its environment. And this is where you, you get into this sentence I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm concerned that there's too much vague fear-mongering and not enough thinking about how our society is most likely to fail. It probably won't be a distinct event, as is known in prepper speak, a jump from capitalism to cannibalism, but could unfold in different ways and lead to different outcomes some more preferable than others. So, uh, what is the future most of us should be concerned about? And then we're going to talk about how what we're going to do about it. Well, of course, uh, some people are going to die in wildfires and have to be uh, migrated because of rising sea levels and things like that. But as I said before, what I think um, is coming for most of us is going to be poverty, um, at least poverty as the way economists see it. So that means uh, a lack of work and a, a lack of industrially created goods, maybe if we're lucky, growing our own food, but also having a lot more leisure time. So I think there is a positive spin on it, but that doesn't preclude plagues and famines and things coming as well. Whether or not we have a zombie apocalypse is kind of up to us. It's a collective decision we have to make. Do you still agree with this statement you made as recently as four months ago? In my mm -hmm. mind, as a Western European, uh, mm -hmm. you're looking at the... It says, I'm currently guessing that widespread food panics will come to dominate international politics in the next two to four years, the introduction of rationing will herald the crumbling of our political and financial freedoms. So in my mind, as a Western European, that two to four years is my window to do whatever I think necessary or desirable or possible with relative freedom after that. Mm -hmm. We're talking after two to four years from now, I think life will become harder 
and choice is narrower. Are you still on this two to four timeline? Two to four year timeline? Well, I was trying to answer the question there and um, probably using the precautionary principle. I think we should live as if we've got uh, only a short period of time and get ready. And for some people, of course, it will be less than that because collapse has already come to much of the world. Um, whether it will, when it will come to South Italy, I don't know. And when it will come to Texas, I don't know. Um, but it's uh, we can't be planning any long-term futures, can we? Uh, well, you know, interestingly, I, I just keep plowing on in my own life, rather, with uh, with my foot in both worlds. Uh, and so now let, let's segue into, now, I, I first met Matthew as I, I've been trying for what what now, Matthew, uh, is it one year or two years trying to get Jim Bendell to uh, to appear on the show and be interviewed by me? Hopefully we're going to make that happen. Uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved with with Jim and, and his work. I don't want you to, I, obviously I am not asking Matthew Slater to put words in Jim Bendell's mouth. I just want to find out how did you two hook up and where do you agree and, and or disagree on how to live out the rest of our days between here and whatever it is that's coming our way? Well, I've known Jim since uh, 2008 when we were both living in Geneva. And he was doing various consulting gigs there, uh, very much a freelancer like myself. We seemed to have a lot of uh, values in common. So we started to do little projects together. And he became very interested in money. And by about 2015, we made the Money and Society MOOC, which you mentioned before, which a lot of people have loved and they've said have changed their lives. And so that was my attempt to rant and rave about the peculiarities uh, and the mysteries of the money system, along with Jem's attempt to be rigorous and check the facts and provide academic references. And that was very good for both of us. But then in uh, 2018... He came back to the subject of climate change, which he'd been putting off in his mind for a long time, and produced a deep adaptation paper. Because um, uh, he wanted to leave academia because all the work he'd done in his whole career didn't seem to be coming to anything when climate change was happening so fast uh, and nobody seemed to be responding appropriately. So the deep adaptation paper was a way of saying, well, look, it's... It's looking inevitable now that there will be catastrophic climate change. And so how should we think about that? Um, and this paper got a very large number of downloads, it seems, and has become very widely talked about. I mean, hundreds of thousands of hits. And so a year ago, I uh, became his executive assistant, started helping him with email and setting up systems. And now deep adaptation is becoming a, a movement. It happens largely on Facebook. There's a positive deep adaptation group um, where people come together to support each other emotionally in the face of probable, inevitable, or even unfolding societal collapse. People come there and they uh, comfort each other. And then they, when they feel better, they often go on to do uh, purposeful things. So Deep Adaptation is a sort of emotional holding group, but projects are coming out of it. So before we, we dive into some of your actual definitions and, and advice, do you or do you not uh, uh, agree with Jim? Or, or, or is he still stating this? Because uh, it was last year in his Deep Adaptation paper, Jim Bendell put his neck out and guessed we had... 10 years before, quote, societal collapse, which means 2028 before society collapses. Uh, as far as you know, does he still think that? And do you agree with that or disagree? Um, as far as I know, he still thinks that. Um, and do I agree? Well, uh, we're, we're talking and we're developing more nuanced views. 
and some of which we've discussed already today. Okay, I will. Uh, I will let. Uh, at some point, I, I I am determined we will have Jim Bendell on the show, and he and he can speak for himself on that. But let's uh, let, let's get to to some of, to some of your own advice. Uh, let me. I, I particularly like like uh, like like this advice since I took it ten years ago myself. I think many of us should be looking at quitting our jobs in the commercial machine, preferably with a spectacular act of nonviolent <laughs> industrial sabotage, cashing in our pensions and inventing and investing in real things we care about, whether it be survival, justice, personal or collective redemption, or just pleasure. There you go, brother. That's as good of advice as I have ever heard in in in, uh, in, in my life. So run with that. Uh, should we all run out now and quit our jobs in the machine? And yeah, if you can find another way to live, um, of course you don't have to do it like uh, with total severance one day to the next uh, most people would do it in a gradual way cutting down to five uh, to four days a week and then less trying to diversify where they get their work from um, and of course it, it also means changing your behavior on the other side of the market because it's not only where you get your money from that we need to think about but where we spend it on so um, we can employ each other uh, in pleasurable ways and uh, uh, in, in ways that create the kind of work that we want to do. So it's not just a matter of um, quitting your job and then living without money or trying to be self-sufficient. It's a matter of building an alternative system um, to cushion the failure of the big system. And so how... Well, well, give us your just give us your advice in a nutshell. Give us your first step advice. So, someone is listening to this, uh, is is new to this whole thing. What is the first step towards towards creating this new way of comporting yourself here? Well, for me, the first step was deciding where to be. And I'm not sure I've decided that fully yet, but most people have a much better idea of where they want to be because they they want to stay close to their family and friends. So once you know where you are, then it's a question of building better and deeper trust relationships with your neighbours and, and the people you want to be involved with um, for social and economic reasons. So I think uh, when we want to start growing food, it shouldn't be seen as a, an individual activity, but uh, we can all specialize and then exchange food and have a richer life because of it. Um, you can do financial innovations, for example, like uh, mutually insuring each other. But that takes a lot of trust. So how do you go about building that kind of trust um, with people that you might just have casual social relations with? Um, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I believe that that's uh, the direction in which we need to be thinking. I know you spent some time uh, visiting uh, these eco villages and whatnot. Do you see yourself eventually settling in an eco village, and do you recommend that pathway to people? Uh, I do recommend it. Um, for some people, the, the eco villages I visited were all in the global eco village network, and because of that, they shared a certain culture which I wasn't quite comfortable with. It was very uh, intimate culture, um, and it involved a lot of um, sitting around talking to each other, um, uh, conflict resolution, emotional sharing. And that's not really my bag, but there could be other eco-villages or other intentional communities where they're a little bit further apart, and I would feel very comfortable. And so I do have my eyes open looking for one of those, um, because I don't want to um, 
go through this world alone or even just with my girlfriend and my family. I want to be part of a, uh, a larger economic unit that works with a lot of mutual trust. Yeah, that all conflict resolution, uh, that tends to, I think, uh, be, be the downfall uh, of, of so many of, uh, of these things. It's it's just, just my guess. So anyway, brother, before we, we are winding down, I do want to, uh, but before we wind up, your, your whole note, this notion of radical giving. Just spend, spend a few minutes talking about the concept of radical giving, what it means and what it will uh, do for you personally and the planet to become a radical giver. Well, I came across that many years ago, uh, and I put it on the front page of my website. Um, it connected to something else, I don't remember, but it just really, really resounded, uh, because that's what I felt that I was doing at the time. I had um, quit my job completely and was writing the software for the open source free software for the local exchange trading system communities, and they were in turn supporting me back. So I was radically giving my skills as a software engineer in exchange for um, accommodation, basically. And I lived like that for two, three, four years, um, more or less. And to me, it, it was a, a very good solution because it meant that I could do what I passionately felt I needed to be doing. And I could at least have my needs met for it. And I, it was very happy and satisfying era of my life. Uh, could it work for everybody? Well, you've probably heard of the Zeitgeist movement and how they plan to destroy all the money. Um, and you've probably heard of people like uh, talking about the gift economy as if yeah. there was no need to exchange anything, but everyone could just give away what was needed. Um, I'm not sure that you could run a large economy on that. Uh, on that premise. But I do think that uh, between friends and neighbours, you can go a long way. And when you do things in the paradigm of the gift, it's so much more conducive to happiness than uh, this conditionality and this counting the pennies that the money system tells us to do. So yes, I think there's a, a lot to be had from the idea of giving everything you can. Um, and, of course, when other people do it, then you get something back as well. And you can inspire it in people. It sounds like you're getting back to your theology degree, that you've got that you've come full circle. <laughs> so, anyway, Matthew Slater, we really, really appreciate you coming uh, on to Collapse Chronicles and spending an hour sharing your views with, uh, with my listeners here. But as I always wrap up these conversations, uh, if you were not speaking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles uh, down here in the deep recesses of YouTube, but actually had the mainstream media's attention, and they stuck a microphone in your face and said, Matthew Slater, you have 60 seconds to give us your soundbite, your message to the planet in late 2019 what would that message to the 60-second message to the world sound like? Well, thanks for giving me lots of time to think about it. I think it's going to be around the subject of money and uh, our attitude towards money. Money is just a story and a belief that we all have in common that uh, it sorts out how we give permission to each other to do things and to give things and receive things. And this system is not as simple as it looks. It's highly political and it favors um, the people in charge of the political system. Obviously, they benefit themselves. Um, and so I would encourage people to start thinking out of the money system and thinking into the gift system. Um, think about doing things unconditionally and because you want to do them. Um, don't think about money as the means to get what you actually want. So you don't have to pursue money to get what you actually want, but you can change what you actually want. 
Um, and if it's around things like quality of relationships, then money is completely irrelevant for that. So I'd like to see a lot less uh, value put on money in this world. Okay, well, I I will uh, cheer you on with with that. I'm I'm hoping we can all. Uh, that's something we all need to work on, brother. But Matthew Slater, once again, we really appreciate you coming on here. But global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse on my camera in one minute. So. Uh, more than anything else, we really appreciate the the sometimes thankless task and the hard work you are putting into making this world a better place. And for more information, I will put the link to mattslats.net. But stick around here after we hang up. But for now, uh, Matthew Slater, thank you, and keep up the good fight, brother. Thanks a lot, Sam. Bye, guys.